Hey, everybody. Hey, how you doing? Does everybody know everybody? Uh, Lewis, do you know uh, Dave Rolf and uh, Chuck Meehan and vice versa? I'm done, guys. How y'all? Nice meeting you. Nice to meet Please. you, Lewis. I want to welcome you to the LBB Great Guns uh, 5 and 30, Anything But Advertising. The idea behind this was that we just really wanted to talk to the leaders who were kind of making the day-to-day -day decisions about uh, our industry, but we wanted to go, get to know you a little bit. I think people see you guys in such high esteem and high places and seeing you talk, they really want to know a little bit about who you are personally, particularly since we're now looking inside your your homes, literally. Let me let Addison say a few words before we get started with the questions. Yeah, I wanted to jump in just very quickly. Just to give a bit of background, LBB began in London in 20, 2011 with the kind of main goal of creating one creative hub for the whole of the global advertising industry. 10 years later, we're, we're working our way towards that, but the USA holds our biggest audience globally. And over that period of 10 years, we've taken kind of countless trips, zipping around various cities across the US, meeting with new friends, meeting with old friends. And obviously those meetings are work meetings, but you know, one of the best things about them is kind of really getting to know the people in a way that email doesn't allow. So, you know, that's the reason that I'm personally over the moon that we're partnering with Oliver and Great Guns on this series, which is very much about the creative spirit that keeps the advertising industry ticking, but more so about the personalities of the people within it. So in a way, it's somewhat filling that gap until we can kind of hop on a plane and meet you guys again in person, basically. Thank you, uh, Addison. I'm honored to introduce our guest today, uh, starting with uh, Mr. Chuck Meehan. He's the co-CCO at McCann Worldwide in Detroit. Welcome, Chuck. How are you doing? Thanks. <laughs> Great to be here. Uh, is there anything you want to tell us a little bit about yourself that we don't know or that what people might be interested in knowing that they don't know? Um, first of all, you have such well, an, an incredible array of art on your back uh, drop and it's such an incredible like you know, <laughs> setting. So you want to tell us about that? <laughs> but the art, I'm not, COVID was not good for me. I don't have a good setup. I've been going into the office actually. I'm not good working like this in any way. So you, you, you're, you're more of a people person. You really want to see people and interact. Totally. I'm so tired of creative directing on screens. I can't tell you. <laughs> it's funny, you know, I woke up today thinking about like the, the country opening uh, soon and how I would react to that. Like when you get to go out, I mean, or do you handshake? Do you fist pump? Do you do this? Do you hug people that you haven't seen? Like it, it's a little scary, that's, right? That's interesting. Is the handshake going to go away? I think I it'll know. just come right back. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. Hugs and, and, and uh, handshakes. I, I think that's kind of a, a good theme. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, thank you. So uh, our next guest, again, uh, David Roth, Global Head of Production, WPP Hogarth, New York City. Welcome, David. Thank you very much, Oliver. Good to see you. Good to see everybody. I, I'm not working from home. I, I'm like Chuck in that it worked from home, didn't work for me. But I mean, it's what we all have to work through, but we've got a small place and we're out on the east end of Long Island and uh, on an island. And usually islands, you don't have any space, but I found some space and I've uh, occupied that for, for a bit as I've started my new job. Um, so I guess that's my, my thing. And by the way, I think I'm into, I want to get back into hugs. I, I might just skip handshakes and just go straight to the like, Is that what I do? Like, just hug I'm every place. And if hugs go away, then there's going to be like a national hug week or something like that, you know, and, or, or, you know, global hug week. Like we just, I think it's just got to become regular again. I miss it a lot. I'm going to go to now our uh, last guest, Mr. Lewis uh, Williams, Chief Creative Officer at Burrell Communications Chicago. Welcome. Hey, man. How are you guys? Nice to be with everyone. Yes, Hello. it's nice to have you guys. Uh, you know, I, I, I saw a little bit about the Lewis and Donna Williams Endowment Fund for Minority and Economically Challenged Art Students. So I, maybe you can talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, I uh, attended Kent State University, you know, the May 4th Kent State University. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I majored, I majored in graphic design. And so, you know, I always, uh, to me, I, I like to give back, you know, uh, Cause I, uh, for me, I'm like, uh, I'm an underdog with chip on my shoulder. So I like to help out other underdogs, you I know what that. I mean? So it's just, uh, I went to school uh, to go back and speak and 
And uh, back in the days when I was there, there wasn't a computer lab and all of that kind of stuff. You grabbed a pad and you drew it. But just seeing that a lot of kids just weren't able to get in these computer labs because they have to pay for them. They have to pay to print. They have to pay to use. And everybody didn't have uh, an Apple uh, laptop. So I was like, these kids need help. So that's uh, just my wife and I sort of like, okay, what's a good tax write off? And help somebody. So, <laughs> like so we put some money out to the side to, to help out uh, some kids that uh, need some help. How long has it been in existence? Oh God, it's been going on for about 15 years. And wow. every year I get, I get a letter from the kid, you know, the school makes them, you gotta, you know, you gotta thank those donors, you know, so you can see the kids. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. And Mrs. Williams, for the money. You know, so as I have a collection of all the notes from the kids, and I call them up and say, "Good luck to you." So, well, uh, again, uh, welcome, guys. Let's get started. The first question uh, it's going to go to uh, to David. The power of words are more important than ever. What is the most inspiring, and what is the most annoying word or words that you've that that have stood out to you in the past year? Okay, well, I've got a recent one that's that's affected me the last couple of weeks in terms of on the plus side, and that's the term possibilitarian. I ran into it in, in a, actually a book review, an old school book review, and uh, it's someone with a marked sense of possibility. You're looking at what, instead of what should happen, it's what ought happen. I look at it as, as combining imagination with uh, positive thinking. So positive thinking is great. I, I'm not sure I'm great at positive thinking, but I think I'm good at imagine it, imaginative positive thinking. On the downside, I think the words, I was tired relatively early on of actual virtual, the word yeah. virtual, yeah. because it's just confusing on what's virtual versus uh, what's real, you know, not to mention IRL. Like IRL is a word that I'm not sure about either anymore because, you know, obviously we're not going to have IRL without virtual and virtual's new IRL in a way. So those words I need, something, something's got to be revised there. Words like possibility and inspiration, imagination are all things that we are all uh, kind of uh, been very familiar with in the past like year. And that's I think we need to have more of those, just like the hugs. I think we need more of those kind of words, mm -hmm. positive possibilities. Chuck, same thing for you. I guess there's a phrase I read recently, especially when the country was going through a lot of turmoil and it was, um, until the power of love beats the love of power, mm. we won't progress. I think Hendrix said it, who was probably quoting Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> Was that before the acid or after? I first read it, but I remember first reading it. Hedrick said it years ago. It's kind of a timeless phrase, right? Right. Um, yeah, when you think about it. And then um, I guess the words I'm tired of hearing are lean in. <laughs> you got to invent some new way to say that. I, I don't, you know. I think it started as a strategist phrase or whatever. You know, right, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just yeah. lean into this thing. I'm like, okay, can we, I just, I don't know. Those words have just been. Said too much. <laughs> Lewis, what about you? It's a little older than the, the year, but this is last year and last year is when it was magnified. And that's Black Lives Matter. It didn't come from ad agency. It didn't come from some strategists. This came from two women that wanted to do something about social justice. And it's just three strong words just sitting right in front of you. You yes. know what I mean? So Black Lives Matter. So, And my, the one that annoys me the most because of what we're going through is uh, all the people, uh, especially some of the clients and stuff, that ask me, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> because, because from a Black perspective, it's been hell to pay the last year, right? Yeah. And yeah. so I get I get a lot of people that mean well, right? It's like, yeah. well, how are you? It's like, well. How the hell do you I'm think I am? <laughs> I mean, it's something like, hey, I see people storming the Capitol. I'm seeing, you know, kids get shot. I'm seeing... Oh, the bullet just went that way. Oops. You know, I was like, I'm not doing so good because I, it's, I, I see those people and I relate to them. You know what I mean? I know that could be me. That could be my son. That could be my family member. So it's like, I have to bite my tongue. Like, I'm fine. Look, both of those are very powerful, but certainly Black Lives Matter. I, I think it's affected everybody uh, on this, uh, on this Zoom uh, and beyond. And for that, that is great. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, great answers, guys. Uh, the second question, if you were given the ability to create one new trend and it be instantly popular, what would it be? Let's, uh, let's go with uh, Chuck Meehan first. A new trend? Yeah. Um, 
would it be to just get rid of the phrase lean in? <laughs> 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 yes. How Sorry. about like truth and facts are sexy again? We all work on the same facts. We're off the yeah. same set of facts. Yes. Imagine when somebody starts spreading one falsehood or one lie or one the amount of time it takes for it to go around globally and how you change that really matters. So I think that's a really big, big yeah, what's, what's, what's the line? A, a lie gets uh, halfway around the world where the truth will get its pants on. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. That's great. It's, I love that. It's absolutely great. What about you, Lewis? You know, I'm with Chuck on that one. I wish we could get, um, use social media for what it was really designed for to connect us you know what i mean and that means that you know that i'm not saying that we all agree on everything right but you know so it's so interesting with these platforms that they've been sort of hijacked and kidnapped you know what i mean you know what i mean and and i would like just put that back in the bottle and do it all over again and allow social media and social platforms to be to represent the best of mankind versus the worst of mankind do you think that that's the, the kind of evolution of the internet that we're kind of learning from all of our mistakes and all the things that we've done in the past and, and change is coming and you feel that? I thought so, but I don't think so. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? It's sort of like, I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm definitely an optimist, you know, but very optimistic about things. But I don't know, I'm more afraid now than I ever been. I mean, that, you know, I, you kind of think that it was gonna self-correct itself like the stock market. You yep. know what I mean? But I'm still waiting on that one. We still going off that cliff, baby. And I, I'm getting a little concerned about it, you know, because we keep, oh, it'll be okay. Oh, it'll be okay. But, ah. you know, yeah. I remember this, this, this soldier said, remember, your enemy has a boat too. You know what I mean? So we just can't assume that it's just going to self-correct because a lot of things in history has happened. If you look back at it, you ask yourself, how did humankind allow that to happen? Yeah. But it did. I just hope yeah. we don't look back at that moment right now. Well, just see the the uh, the QAnon documentary that out that's out right now. Yeah. That whole thing yeah. was started by some kid in the Philippines, it's, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, apparently mm -hmm. the, he just threw something out there, and it turned into a yeah. We're, we're, yeah, yeah. But you know, but we're but we're we are part of that. You know, kind of uh, moving that forward because you know here people are going to see this you know, this Zoom uh, conversation, who have not heard about the documentary that's QAnon that's existing right now, uh, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But again, it's, you know, it's a, it is a perpetuating kind of monster, you know? So I, I think, uh, yeah, uh, now I'm concerned. Gosh, dog it. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Mr. Dave? I think I'm gonna kind of ruin the, the, the this, this, this particular question. I'm a little more self-serving, but I think I wanna start the trend, particularly it's topical because we're all coming back, but I'd like it if bartenders in New York City could become nice, particularly to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. okay. like it's, it's a problem out there. And <laughs> if I could start a trend, it would be that. Like if we could just, should we, should we do a PSA campaign, Dave? Should we work together on that? <laughs> I bet you've been a bartender before. You would have been so mean to me. Like, you know, like, well, like give us an example of the meanness or the harshness. Well, how yeah. does it come out? How does it, how does it actually? If you go to a bar in New York City, particularly anything that's cool, you, you are just, there's one thing that's for sure. You are way less cool than the bartender. Like, that's just it. Like, it's, it's just an understood yeah. thing. It's mainly in New York, you know? So my friends know about it. I'm like, oh God, do I have, how am I gonna order this drink? They're just gonna, I'm so annoying. I just, I don't know what to drink, you know? Like. <laughs> <laughs> so Dave, do you go to like dive bars? Are you going to like dive bars? Are you yeah, which kind of bars are you going to? Yeah, dude, well, you gotta lower your, you go to lower your grade you there. If you go to really bad bars, which are actually cool bars, it's bad because they can tell that you don't usually go to bad bars. Yeah, right. So they can just they can just smell you out. And then if you go to a really good bar, then you know, also I don't really have time to go to good bars very much. And they know that I'm kind of an imposter there too. So okay, I so just you're, you're, I don't you're know, too I good for one happen. and not good enough for the other. So the remedy is you open your own bar, the Dave Roth bar. <laughs> That's right. It's back there. <laughs> the wine, the wine, 
There's a wine fridge somewhere. He's always nice to himself. There you go. We'll be, we'll be there. We'll be there uh, soon, and you can, you know, Hold on. I will be so nice to you. Okay, good, good. I love it. I love it. That's brilliant. So on to the next question. Uh, what is the most unusual skill that you ever learned? And I'm going to go with Mr. Lewis first. The most you unusual know skill. I, I struggle with this one, man, because I'm like, skill? That's unusual? <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things I, 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 I was so excited when I was able to do a headstand in yoga. I mean, I know that's not unusual, but, you know, but it was, it was one, what was nice about it. Um, I did a print ad, um, I won this award. So I got a chance to do a print ad and I, and I did it in a headstand. So it gave me a very interesting visual, you know what I mean? Cause I could go to headstand, but I don't know if you're a yogi, it's, it's not unusual, but I just was excited, you know, cause I never thought I could do it, but I struggled for that one. I couldn't find one guys. I don't know about you. Oh, that's interesting. Well, first of all, like I, I think there's some congratulations. I, I just read that you were uh, chosen for Can Lions for uh, the PR jury this year, right? Mm -hmm. I think what's important about that is really interesting because at, at a time that we've never anyone has ever experienced, you get to talk about work uh, during a pandemic. I mean, it's going to be a totally different experience, uh, I would think, right? Yeah, for three hours, for three or four hours for four days, right? So, <laughs> oh, look, look at him. He's already counting the schedule. <laughs> the schedule. What about you, Chuck? Uh, unusual skill. Well, I don't, I don't know if I learned this, but I do have an aptitude for impressions. Oh, wow. Cool, cool, cool. cool. Bring it on. Bring it on. You told oh, me just the other day that you, you do a very good Will Ferrell. You, yeah, yeah right. well, actually, the No Way Norway just won an Andy. That was yeah, great. right? Congrats. Congratulations. Yeah. That's amazing. Good, good. But I had good, to, man. thank you, thank you. But I had to present the spot to like, you know, a zillion people and I had to present to his agent and I kind of did Will and his agent goes, you sound just like him. So it kind of helped. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll tell one quick story where it comes in handy. We were shooting Charlie Sheen for Fiat. It was, it was about, I don't know, eight years ago. And he was driving a Fiat in a house at a Super Bowl party. Yep. I remember yeah, yeah. My colleague, Rob Strasberg, I was shooting something else. He said, hey, come over and help us out with it. We were doing the end joke. He drives around the house and then he stops. And we didn't have an end line. So I was running lines in his voice. <laughs> <laughs> I was standing right behind Antoine Fuqua directed it. I'm standing behind him. And I'm doing his voice. And his wife looks at me and goes, you sound just like him. And the bit was he stops. And he gets out of the car to the, hot, to the good looking girl and he goes, I love being under house arrest. <laughs> and we didn't have an end line. And we need an end line. And I go, have him look at the girl and I go, what do I get for good behavior? And, <laughs> <laughs> and Sheen was like 10 feet from him. And he looked at me and he goes, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> so Dude, that's brilliant do your will ferrell come on give us your best I, will ferrell's too hard but is he well who else do you do i'll do a quick walk and oh i love walk and go i'll go to my buddy listen dave ronald <laughs> you boy you're good wow you're crazy or not that's it <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant <laughs> That is that is a Christopher Walken. Uh, I've done that in a meeting too, actually. Uh, that's now, Christopher Walken has said said my name. That's a that's a I that's an amount. Exactly. Just, I, yeah, I, Chuck, I that's how you sell your ideas. I was just that's how Chuck sells his ideas, man. It helps. Like, Sometimes it helps. <laughs> oh my God! Now you know how parents feel when they uh, they tell their can their kids to like dance for the beatball, dance, you know, sing. Dave, what about you? Um, but it's pretty, I think that one's easy for me. And I think some of my friends would know it. It's a skill that I, I learned when I was young, when I was a kid. And it was actually, I'm not kidding. It was key to my success in production when I was young on sets, when I was a, when I was a PA. Grapes. I can catch a grape in my mouth, but I can catch it now. And then back then, which I developed in my 20s, but I can catch a grape in my mouth from as far away as anyone can throw it. So there's no, it's an endless, like, so as far as way as you can throw it in the air, I can catch it in my mouth. 
how do we test this uh, for truth? Well, follow me on Instagram. There's you can find it there. <laughs> all right, all right. You're right here. That, I'll film it. I'll film it as a follow up. Whatever. We'll get. Uh, I love it. You heard it here. Yeah. Dave, Dave Rolf, the great charmer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can imagine though how it is. Like you got a director at this long craft, you know, the long lunch yeah. table, and then it gets mentioned, and then. Somebody, I run away, and sure enough, you know, I was a young PPPA, and I'm like, sure, I'll do it. And I just run far away. They're like, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going away. That's how far I can catch it. And the, it was a little bit downhill, and the director got up and threw the grape high up in the air, and I was about 30, 40 feet away, and I caught it. That is brilliant. I think we're going to go to the next uh, question. It's going to be from Addison. What topic could you give a 30 minute impromptu lecture on? But obviously the caveat is that it, it can't be about anything to do with advertising. Lewis, you wanna go first? Well, yeah, uh, yeah um, I said, but it's about culture. And uh, I, would, I would talk about the uh, global, the global influence of the African-American culture. You know, because what's interesting about the African-American culture is that it came from nothing. Right. I mean, you know what I mean? People came from a land that they was, you know, stolen from and you went to a place you didn't know. So this culture had to start and it's only 400 years old. Right. So but yet a 400 year old culture now can has global impact and cultural impact all over the world. I did um, a, a, um, a global campaign for American Airlines and I went to Helsinki, Finland, uh, Helsinki, Finland. I saw the, the coolest. Uh, African-American exhibit in Helsinki, Finland. You know what I mean? I'm like, Helsinki, yeah. Finland? It's like, <laughs> what the hell is that doing over here? And then I'm listening to this rap station. I'm like, God, you know, I mean, I just didn't expect to see black culture to that level in Helsinki, Finland. So that's what I could, I could talk about just like that. I think okay. you just did it. That was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and then Chuck? Um, I could give a lecture on D-Day. Cool, cool. And years ago, I did a campaign for the D-Day Museum that luckily won a ton of awards. And I, I think I read four or five books on that day before I started working on it. Is that like a nerdy interest before that or did it just come out of working on the- Yeah, on the I'm, I'm, kind of a, I'm kind of a history buff and I, I, World War II fascinates me because like every year there's a new story about, or movie about World War II. It's incredible mm -hmm. how many stories came out of that war. And um, so I, anyway, I read about four books just on that day, and it was just pretty fascinating, so. Wow. Uh, that was a hell of a day, man. Just D-Day was a hell of a day. Oh boy. Yeah. Incredible. I still can't, you know, the film, um, what's, uh, Save It Private Ryan? Yeah. 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 I can't see that opening. You know what I mean? I saw that opening once. I, I, well, I it's interesting because that opening, it's right out of Stephen Ambrose's book. And when I saw the film, he followed that. There's things that happen on the beast that are in that book, like exactly. Even wow. guys dragging their arm, like he, he, he did it. I was watching it going, oh my God. Yeah. And Ambrose was a consultant on the film. So it was pretty accurate. Oh, yeah, pretty accurate. Yeah, I could, I said, those guys, man. But there's a good story. They screened the film for Stephen Ambrose. And it got through the end and Spielberg's like, you got any notes? He goes, yeah, Hanks is too old to play that role. <laughs> <laughs> really? Wow. Well, yeah, because right. his, yeah. whatever he was, would he, he would have like, been yeah, that yeah. old. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, D-Day, they purposely sent like most of the 19 year olds that hadn't seen action yet because they knew the veterans would be like, I don't want, <laughs> I know what's coming. Wow. Holy shit. Ooh. Woo. Okay, Dave. Let's see. I, I have a big thing where the I think the NBA is benignly rigged, basically. So it's rigged, but it's rigged perfectly. It's rigged so that the sport is still pure, but but it's it's perfectly rigged. I like talking about wine, but I love prefer I preferably talk like to talk about cheap wine. I like wine lists that are small, not big, and more well curated and so forth. I think cooking is basically just like yummy chemistry, like talking about that. I like talking about producers that I've worked with in the past have probably heard me talk about what the meaning of a clockwork orange is about uh, and what a fascinating concept that is, not just a book by Burgess and a movie by Kubrick, but how it's also about how you can't automate things that are organic. So I like that subject matter. 
I'm European, so I can't pretend to know lots about the NBA. Um, but can you just elaborate slightly on why you think it's perfectly rigged? <laughs> yes, and benignly yeah. and perfectly. Oh. Um, it's pretty simple. It's, it's rigged such that the regular season is long. It would be very difficult to sustain interest in the, the regular season. So teams have to perform well throughout the, throughout the regular season in order to earn a high seed. Once they've got a high seed, they are, get more generosity come playoff time. I call it that they're going to be, if you're in the top two seeds, you're going to earn yourself a game six in the conference finals, in my opinion. Okay. Thanks. That was a very condensed version of your half an hour lecture. Sorry. Wow. <laughs> the fifth question, the words inclusion and diversity have been used more than ever this past year with many varied definitions for each. So is there a difference between the two? If so, how would you define them? Let's go with uh, Lewis first. Well, this has been HR's year, right? You know what I mean? So <laughs> I put that like with Chuck's lean in and everything. Like, you know, it's like yeah. you can't yeah. you can't really have one without the other. You know what I mean? And, and it's sort of like in plain sight. It, it's, you know, I mean, it's such an HR thing. And that's one of those words, too, that I'm sort of like you know, getting annoyed with hearing. Uh, because it's, it's the words, but it's not follow up with any actions of how to do it. You know what I mean? They sort of nouns, right? But you know what I mean? But there's no plan on how to actually do it. So, right. I mean, what's diversity without inclusion? What's inclusion without diversity? So we talk about it like they're two different things, right? But right. we all know that, you know, the more gumbo we we are, the better things are. We sort of know that and, and we're preaching these things like... Uh, it's the silver bullet to everything. It's the answer to everything. And it's, and it's just really so simple. So we're making a big deal out of anything. But again, how can you have diversity without inclusion? How can you not have inclusion without diversity? So that's kind of how I feel about that. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I mean, I do think that we have to keep the conversation going because I do think that, you know, once, yeah. Yeah. once, once the words are silenced or removed, it, yeah. Yeah. There, there is no conversation. So I think we Yeah, just... you know, maybe because... You know, we just don't have any better words for it yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? You yeah. know what I'm saying? And that's yeah. what it is. So it is doing what it needs to do. I just wish we just sort of just get the concept of it more, you know, together. But maybe that's something I'll do some thinking on, you know? There you go. Yeah. I'd love to hear that. I'd love to be the first one uh, that you uh, lay that on. Uh, okay. Yes, what about you, Chuck? You know, I think in inclusion can mean, you know, just giving everybody a, a seat at the table you know, regardless of gender or skin color, you know, where, you know, a, a junior's yeah. opinion can have as much weight as a upper management person so that everybody gets heard, you know, mm -hmm. I think. Um, yeah. and, and diversity, you know, again, other than skin color or gender, it's just bringing different perspectives and different thinking than your own, mm -hmm. you know, wh whatever that looks like. Right, you know? right. So, so I think yeah. they're, they're kind of two sides of the same coin, but there are a little different. Mm -hmm. Do you believe you can have one without the other? Well, I think, again, I think they work hand in hand. Right, right. Got it. You know, yeah. If you strive for diversity, you will have inclusion. If you strive for inclusion, you will have diversity, I think. That's great. What about you, Dave? Yeah. I, I You know, I maybe hearkening on what Lewis was mentioning that it does, we do, it does seem like the, the word inclusion needs more potency. And I, I think that's that can and will happen. I guess for me, what it means is the invitation of representation or, or diverse representation or added representation, but, but also to the degree that it disrupts or neutralizes the sort of power of the original source. In other words, it, like it, I think that if you're really committed to inclusion, you have to do it not just simply to add range. You've got to do it because you want to sort of refigure what the original thing is. And, and that's the importance of inclusion. And that should be the outcome of inclusion is that you're kind of, like I said, you're neutralizing singularity of a perspective or something like that. And instead, you, you've got a new outcome based on the inclusive action. Right. So I know that that's a little heady, but I think the point is, is that we've got to also look for neutralized sort of power constructs when we're looking at, at uh, it, when we're looking at being inclusive. I, I love that because it goes back to what Lewis said. It's like 
we just, we throw these words out and, you know, I don't think we really, you know, are there other words that you can use to get people to really understand that? But I think you really hit it. It's neutralizing the conversation so that there's a point to start. Or equalizing. Yeah. Or equalizing, equalizing, equalizing it. You know, I go back to, we cannot stop talking about this because inclusion and diversity are just so important on, on, mm -hmm. on every level, not only in, in, in advertising, but everything that we do in terms of our yeah. friends and how we, you know, everything. I mean, families, it's crazy. I have a, uh, my niece, my oldest niece is married to a Samoan. Uh, and he, uh, he went to school, he, he, for some reason, there's a big, large Samoan community in uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, and because he was behaving badly as a teenager, uh, his parents sent him down to my sister's house in the South. Uh, so imagine this Samoan uh, who was felt, felt very, very uncomfortable in Salt Lake City, although he was with his tribe, goes down to Louisiana. Uh, and he meets my my niece, uh, and uh, it's 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 just a really important word for my family. It's a, it's a, the, both of those words. So I appreciate your uh, response mm -hmm. um, to that. It's really important. Mm -hmm. Given what you guys know uh, today, what would you tell your ten year old self? Let's start with you, Mr. Chuck. That's a tough one. That wasn't in the list. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is you think you have time. You know, if you're yeah. passionate about something, go after it. Don't wait. I love that. It's great to hear uh, leaders talk about things like this because it's important for young people to hear what you've experienced. And that is a big one. What about you, Lewis? Yeah, that's, that's a good one. You know, I wouldn't want to spoil him because I want him to go through some of those things I went through because that, you know, that builds the character. So I'll just whisper in his ear like, you'll be okay, kid. And that's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know guys you know what I mean I guess you got to go you got to get your head knocked you got to you know you got to make those mistakes but at the end of the day I say you know what man you're just going to be okay he's gonna like what do you mean by okay then I'll just leave you know <laughs> I'm not going to give you any details I mean you know you know I don't want you to think about it too much should I go left should I go right you know but it's just at the end of the day you'll just be okay but what a better way to go through life, you know, as a kid going into adulthood, knowing that you're going to be okay. And what does that mean to you? You know what I mean? Yeah. One quick story. I remember a buddy of mine, we was, you know, doing things that teenagers do, you know, and then the car went into a spin, right? We went, <laughs> we was coming up on this, this, this telephone pole, right? And we both did like this right here. Stop. That's this time. <laughs> <laughs> And then he and I just looked at each other. And, and the ride was quiet all the way home. So that's oh, what yeah. I mean. You're going you're gonna to be okay. Because I thought that moment was like not going to be so good. <laughs> oh, my God. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. What about you, Dave? I was going to say it's going to be okay, too. Like, it's, it's going to be okay. Like, that, that, you know, that would have been profound. But it would be amazing and profound if somebody could tell you like this voice, whatever, that when you're 10 years old, that someday you're going to be the father of a son or daughter that is 10 years old. And, and, and the, that you're getting advice, but that ultimately, if you were 10 to realize that someday you will be giving advice in one shape or form to a 10 year old that is your offspring, it would be profound. Yeah. Well, I'd say, nah, nah, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> that's not going to happen. That's amazing. Yeah. I would also say, always think like a 10 year old. Oh, <laughs> yeah. ah, that's brilliant. You're most creative when you're a kid because you don't have yeah. norms and rules and you don't know any of them. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's, that's brilliant. Yeah. I think people that thrive in this business keep that. that it gets beaten out of you. Yeah. Of yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask one more question. What is the most important intelligence or wisdom? What do you think, Lewis? Hands down wisdom. Um, my father, you know, I'm from the South, Macon, Georgia, right? Yeah. Home of Otis Red and Little Richard, all the oh, yeah. band. Okay. Yeah. So, and he went to the fourth grade. You know, he was from a real small town, you know, um, went to the fourth grade, all that stuff. And he's he's the smartest man I ever knew, you know. And his wisdom showed I remember I was learning how to drive, you know. So I'm yeah. driving down the street and there was a paper bag in the road. He said, uh, son, watch out for that paper bag. Of course, I hit the paper bag. <laughs> of course. 
And it, and he says, I thought I said, you know, said, don't hit the paper bag. I go like, there's a paper bag, dad. He said, but how did you know what was in it? Mm. I go like, oh shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't mean to curse. But, but, right. we, but you know, it sounded like I saw a paper bag. He said it could have been a glass bottle in the paper bag. That could, you know, I didn't see that. I just saw a paper bag and assumed it was just a paper bag. And that was wisdom. You know what I mean? So here's a man, fourth grade education, made smart financial decision, raised three great kids, great husband. You know what I mean? So wisdom, I'll take it hands down. I love it. That's great. Great, great story. What about you, Chuck? It's interesting because when I first hear, hear that, my brain immediately goes to wisdom. And that is true for everything Lewis said. But then if you unpack it a little bit, you can also look at it as wisdom is gained through time and experience. Mm -hmm. And depending on your age, that's gonna change. So then you're gonna have to lean on intelligence. Good point, good point. I mean, can you have wisdom at an early age? Oh, sure, depends, depends what you've been through, you know, there's, that's basically there's older, there's older souls at younger ages, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, that, that's yeah, what people yeah, say. Yeah. Totally can. Yeah. It's basically cultivated instinct. Yeah, yeah and cultivated. sometimes intelligence yeah. helps you get this idea and that idea. Wisdom sometimes knowing the difference, right? So they they work together yeah. too. What about you, Dave? Yeah, I mean, I feel like in order to well, I feel like intelligence is the lesser defined of those two, even though perhaps wisdom is more abstract, but I, I feel like you can't have wisdom without having intelligence. I, Lewis, you related a story when you were young. I remember I got the most, I, I got the best advice of all my high school years, uh, even though I had great teachers and what have you, but I got the most profound and memorable advice from a metal shop teacher that I was taking my mm -hmm. senior year as a, mm -hmm. as a, um, as a uh, as a senior, an elective, and he he, I'll never forget what he told me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think instinct again, applied instinct can't come without great intelligence fundamentally. So anyway, go wisdom. I think uh, it's important what you guys think, and it's important for the people that are in our industry and that are going to be seeing this uh, to hear what you have to say. You never know how you affect a person until they come up to you, you know, when you're old or at some point in their career or their life and say, you know what, you meant a lot to me 20 or 30 years ago. So uh, I think you guys have said some profound, introspective, uh, very thoughtful words today. I really appreciate your time. Time is really valuable. I'm honored and I so appreciate seeing all of you. Chuck, Dave, Lewis, uh, thank you guys very much. Can't wait to see you guys all in person. Yeah. I mean, give you a we're all hugging it out. Hugging it out. Hey, Dave, I drink. might kiss you on the cheek. Okay, just so you yeah, know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and drink, and, drink. And, and, well, and we, we're gonna let Dave pick the bar. We yeah, let Dave pick the bar. <laughs> but we're gonna leave him at. We're gonna leave him at the table. Yeah. I'll get the drink. I'll get the drinks. I'll come back. I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to go to that bar. And if the bartender's nice to me, then it's about Dave. Yeah, just it's about Dave. Dave. Right? Yeah. There you go. Hit it right there. Okay, yeah. brothers. We really hey, appreciate guys. it. Have a great right. day. Thanks, all Thank you, guys. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Good to meet everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Be well. All right.